Please welcome to News Mongolian MNB World. I am Jugder Gambold. And uh, for our top stories, Mongolia proposes new housing law for fair living conditions. Tourist numbers surge in Mongolia. Europe Day will be organized on May 11th at Sukhpatar Square. For the news, stay with us. The legislation concerning Mongolia's sovereign wealth fund mandates the equitable distribution of mineral resource profit to all citizens for vital needs, such as health care, education and housing. To enact this provision, the Cabinet has developed and deliberated on the draft national housing law, planned to be submitted to the state grid trial next week. This proposed law governs government financial assistance for housing development and establishes a housing fund outlining its accumulation management, expenditure and performance oversight. Structured into six chapters and 21 articles, the proposed national housing law is per Mongolia's constitution and existing statutes. Its passage would establish a robust framework for housing management, foster sustainable financial growth based on market principles, improve accessibility and create a legal basis for supporting low- and middle-income demographics through rental and rent-to-own housing initiatives. Based on data from the 2022 housing census, 32.1% of Mongolia's 941,547 households reside in apartments with proper engineering infrastructure. 29.7% live in houses that lack lacking complete engineering infrastructure and 38.2% live in traditional gears. In Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia's capital, a significant 50.1% of households totaling 216,989 reside in Gir districts without adequate infrastructure, contributing to approximately 75% of the city's air and soil pollution. The implementation of this legislation aims to create a healthy and safer living environment for Ulaanbaatar residents, fostering productivity and providing improved conditions for education and development. Additionally, it seeks to elevate household income and living standards while offering legal assistance for housing to those relocating to rural areas. Mongolia welcomed a total of 86.2 thousand tourists in the first quarter of this year, marking an impressive 10.5% increase compared to the same period last year. Notably, Chinese tourists led the surge with a 2.3-fold increase, followed by significant boosts from South Korea, Kazakhstan and Japan. Regarding nationality, Chinese visitors accounted for about 37% of all foreign arrivals, with Russians closely behind with around 35%, about 10% were South Koreans, 2.5% were from Kazakhstan, 2% from Japan and the remaining 13% were from other countries. The majority of inbound foreign passengers hailed from East Asia and the Pacific region, comprising more than 55% of the total, while Europe accounted for almost 40%. Meanwhile, outbound travel from Mongolia saw a doubling in tourism-related trips, totaling 443.9 thousand, while other purposes like employment and study experienced a slight decline. Male adults constituted the majority of outbound passengers. Border crossings into Mongolia witnessed a substantial rise of more than 57 percent, with over a million passengers crossing in the first quarter. Zamiud emerged as the busiest entry point handling 32.5% of inbound traffic, followed by Chinggisai International Airport and Khashun Suhat with 11.3% and 10.5% respectively. The majority of inbound passengers were Mongolian citizens, comprising over 83% of total arrivals. Now please take a look at current affairs of Mongolia. 
Europe Day 2024 will be organized on May 11th of 2024 at the Zuhbatur Square. This year marks the 35th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Mongolia and the European Union. Throughout the day, 70 booths will showcase Europe's unique heritage, vibrant culture, distinctive charms, tourism and educational opportunities, and visa information. You will be able to taste Europe through many authentic European products on display. Musicians and performers will bring the richness of Europe's heritage to this stage with live music and cultural exhibitions. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations warns of escalating biodiversity loss in Asia-Pacific, posing a grave threat to food security and future habitats. Recent FAO reports highlight food insecurity spikes in Asia-Pacific, where half of the world's undernourished people reside and nearly 45% cannot afford a sustainable diet. This crisis is fueled by conflicts, climate crisis and dwindling biodiversity, impacting natural forests crucial for water, soil, climate regulation and resources like food and medicine. John Jin Kim, Assistant Director General and Regional Representative of FAO, emphasizes the urgent need to address biodiversity loss. FAO advocates for sustainable practices across agriculture, aquaculture, fisheries and forestry. To tackle biodiversity loss and climate change, FAO calls for halting deforestation, promoting restoration and scaling up initiatives like the reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation RIDD Plus program. FAO in Asia-Pacific works on transforming food system sustainability involving all stakeholders for better production, nutrition and environmental quality. Now please have a currency exchange rates provided by the Mongol Bank. Now please have a foreign news partnered with international news agencies. The U.S. warned Thursday that Israel would deal a strategic victory to Hamas if it carried through with an all-out assault on Rafah, the last major militant stronghold in Gaza. As President Joe Biden threatened to pause more military assistance to Israel if it goes through the operation in the city, where more than one million civilians are sheltering. Biden last week paused a shipment of large bombs to Israel over concern that the weapons are of the type that have caused significant civilian casualties in Gaza and would almost certainly do so if Israel conducts a major offensive on Rafah. This is very straightforward. He's going to continue to provide Israel with the capabilities that it needs, all of them. But he does not want certain ca categories of American weapons used in a particular type of operation in a particular place. And again, he's been clear and he's been consistent on that. As the president said, Israel has not yet launched such an operation. So he was talking about what would happen in the future if they did. That's a choice that Israel will have to make. And it's one we hope they don't. We're going to keep working with them on our part to develop alternative approaches that we think will have a better chance of strategic success, a better chance at eliminating the threat that the Israeli people still face from Hamas. More broadly, the president has tasked his team to continue to work with Israel to refine their strategy to inflict an enduring defeat on Hamas. And I want to repeat that. An enduring defeat on Hamas certainly remains the Israeli goal, and we share that goal with them. Smashing into Rafah, in his view, will not advance 
that objective. We'll not get to that sustainable, enduring defeat of Hamas. He has also floated holding up future shipments of bomb guidance kits and artillery to Israel in hopes that the threat will turn Israel back from an operation in the city. The U.S. maneuver are the, its sharpest moves, yet to influence the decision-making of its ally as it wages a seven-month war on the militant group after Hamas' October 7th attack, which killed some 1,200 people in Israel and led to about 250 being taken captive. Our view is uh, that uh, Rafa operations, certainly uh, any kind of major uh, Rafa ground operation would actually strengthen Hamas's hands uh, at the negotiating table, not Israel's. Uh, that's our view. Like Talks in Cairo meant it securing a six-week ceasefire to allow for the release of some hostages, and the search of food and aid to civilians in Gaza are continuing. Kirby added, even though Central Intelligence Agency's director Bill Burns and other delegations to the talks left Egypt on Thursday without a deal. Russian President Vladimir Putin joined military personnel in Moscow's Red Square on Thursday for a Victory Day parade, underscoring the nation's celebration of its World War II victory over Nazi Germany. Despite the dwindling number of veterans from that area, Victory Day remains a crucial element of Russia's national identity, symbolizing resilience and sacrifice amid historical challenges. Russian military personnel were joined by Russian President Vladimir Putin in Moscow's Red Square on Thursday for a Victory Day parade. Russia is wrapping itself in patriotic pageantry for Victory Day, a celebration of its defeat of Nazi Germany in World War II that President Vladimir Putin has turned into a pillar of his nearly quarter century in power and the justification of his move into Ukraine. Even though few veterans of what Russia calls the Great Patriotic War are still alive, 79 years after Berlin fell to the Red Army, the victory over Nazi Germany remains the most important and widely revered symbol of the country's prowess and a key element of national identity. Thursday's festivities across Russia, led by Putin, who this week began his fifth term in office, recalled that wartime sacrifice in what has become its most important secular Holiday. The Soviet Union lost about 27 million people in the war, an estimate that many historians consider conservative, scoring virtually every family. Nazi troops overrun much of the Western Soviet Union when they invaded in June 1941, before being driven back all the way to Berlin, where the Soviet Union's hammer and sickle flag was raised above the ruined capital. The U.S. UK, France and other allies marked the end of the war in Europe on 8th of May. The immense suffering and sacrifice in cities like Stalingrad, Kursk and Putin's native Leningrad, now Street Petersburg, still serve as a powerful symbol of the country's ability to prevail against seemingly overwhelming challenges. Since coming to power on the last day of 1999, Putin has made 9th of May, an important part of his political agenda, featuring displays of military might. Now please uh, take a look at international current affairs. Smoke was seen rising over the southern Gaza Strip area of Rafah on Thursday morning. An Israeli tank brigade seized the Rafah crossing between Gaza and Egypt early Tuesday. The limited incursion does not appear to be the start of the full-scale invasion of the crowded southern city that Israel has repeatedly promised. The U.S. has urged Israel not to launch a full-on assault on Rafah because it would worsen Gaza's humanitarian catastrophe, and it posed a shipment of bombs to its close ally last week over those concerns. All right, that's all for today. Thank you for staying tuned. We'll see you next time with more news and updates. Have a good day.